Um, but we are more than happy to welcome our special guest, another friend of mine, a close friend, uh, Wilhelm Weber from SHS as your next host on stage. Go faster, go faster. <laughs> Thank One you. second. Thank you. And Thank obviously, you. as soon as the slides are uh, changed to our next panel, we have the guys waiting down here for us. We will be speaking about the new uh, re revenue management era. And in the beginning, I thought maybe I should present this myself. And then I thought, hold on, Daniel, you know nothing about revenue management. So I called Wilco, <laughs> obviously. He's my choker next to uh, Pontus. He's my second choker as well whenever it comes to revenue management. And I thought, OK, why not invite more people that are smarter than me whenever it comes to revenue management? So here they are. Fabian, Pontus, Alex, welcome on stage. And Michael in a second when he has uh, got rid of his headset as well. And your Yes, yes. Hi. And obviously, in the live chat for the online audience, there will be Brandon May as your chat host. So bring in all your questions. He will raise them at the end of the panel. I'll give you guys a microphone in a second, and here we go. The stage is yours. OK, thank you very much, Daniel. I mean, to be very honest, good morning, everybody. When I saw that event and I saw the lineup of you guys, I actually did not want to come to Cologne, but uh, I couldn't resist it, because meeting all of you guys after the pandemic again is great. What Daniel actually said is, um, is also true for myself. Um, this is going to be a great session because we have a panel which is much smarter than I am. So I have just to read down a couple of questions and you guys, your job is to give like really smart cutting edge answers. Okay. But first of all, to introduce, Alexander comes from Beyond Price. Um, Alexander is, um, he has a Swiss heritage as well, like myself, actually. You worked in St. Moritz for a couple of times. Are you a good skier? Absolutely. I'm, I'm even a better snowboarder, actually. You're a better snowboarder. Yeah. Well, that's, that's going to be cool. Fabian, snowboarder or ski? Uh, I grew up in the north. None. OK. It was Flatlands, but he's now living in the south of Germany. And you programmed something, which when the first time I had the chance to test the beta version, was just absolutely mind-blowing, because the integration time was five minutes. Pontus, I know we met a couple of years ago, because you basically built a similar company like we did in Switzerland, just in the bigger market of Germany. Ski or snowboard as a Swedish guy? Uh, ski touring, actually. Ski and touring. And thanks for giving the inspiration back in the day. Very good. Thank you. And Mike, last not least, we heard a lot about you right now. Ski, snowboard? Upper, upper ski. Oh, wow. <laughs> upper ski? <The> best. <laughs> OK, I'm going I'm to sing you the Ischgl song later on. Guys, thank you very much for coming this morning. And the first question, of course, looking uh, by the way, welcome to Brandon as well. Having Brandon on the chat is actually like the fifth of us up here, or the sixth of us, so a brother in mind. Having you up here after the pandemic, the first question, and this is like really something which was striking me. I was looking at the last 18 months and I was asking myself, did we actually learn something? Did we do something better? Did we do something better in this crisis than in the last one? And I'd be curious to know that from you guys. Michael, did, did you guys in Duetto realize some big change compared to former crisis, something we did better or worse? Yeah, and what I mentioned in my presentation as well, right? I think we did quite well as an industry, right? And probably we were the industry who had to adopt uh, the quickest and the hardest because we were hit pretty bad, right? So obviously I, I was provoking with some kind of challenges, but first of all, I think we did very well and we see now what's happening now. So, so for us as a company, yeah, we had to do quite some, some changes, right? Because it was the first pandemic for everybody. Like no. Nobody has an experience. There's no kind of playbook how, you, how to run through a pandemic, right? Um, so for us, the biggest challenge, uh, I, I would say, um, was working out with the forecast, yeah. right? Um, you couldn't rely on, on any historic patterns any longer. Um, luckily, our system is not depending on the forecast, so we look for demand, which is a good thing. But still, when you look at reporting, which is very important for a lot of kind of companies out there to, to do their forecast budgets and so on, uh, you certainly had to uh, amend that. And also for the pricing decisions, yep. you couldn't go back a year, same time last year. So one easy thing we've done, which always sounds like a very easy fix, but we had to go from same time last year to same time two, ye uh, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, make that X, right? So giving the opportunity to different regions to compare the data from week to week or month to month, but not to the, the last year anymore. Well, I, I, I do agree to that because um, I admitted on a different conference that never ever in my entire professional life I was so wrong with my forecasts like in the first quarter of 2019. 
uh, because nobody predicted a, a lockdown. I mean, that was a completely new situation. Pontus, uh, what do you think that we did different or better or worse than in the last crisis? I think, first of all, what was cool to see, just like Michelle said, we were super hard hit as an industry. And what you could also see in the beginning that everyone kind of panicked and, you know, fired people left and right and, and everything. What I think we proved in revenue management was that it works also within the crisis time and actually makes a difference. And it's not only about optimizing, uh, you know, demand uh, of 200%, uh, but it's also about bringing hotels up from maybe 40 to 50%, but still beating the market and so on. And so you could really see that revenue management made a difference. And then I think also like Michael mentioned, um, the data was an issue for a while. I think we're going to come quickly out of that, however, in the optimization process. But that at the same time, the strategic work uh, became more and more important, right? So not only sitting uh, on your ass optimizing what's coming in, but being more proactive in the role, looking at distribution, and looking how you can find business for the hotels. And there's the saying in revenue management that you can never create demand. And I think we've kind of put that saying on its edge. Um, maybe still not in a way, depending how you look at it, but certainly it's been a more proactive approach to capturing even more demand or widening the demand spectrum for a whole market. Well, you're talking now about 40 to 50 percent occupancy. What I remember is we popped champagne in Geneva when we hit 30 percent again. Yeah, exactly. And it was yeah. the first time that I drank champagne on a 30 percent occupancy. Uh, so, so 40 to 50 already sounded like uh, pretty late 2020. Uh, but what did you do in revenue? I mean, what did we do better when we actually had empty hotels, Fabian? Did you see anything that we did different? I have a slightly different approach um, or a different opinion. I think as a function, we shed the bed, right? <laughs> the, if, we, if we're looking back from where we came from, like let's go five, six, seven years ago, right? Fundamentally, nothing has changed in the revenue management space. Um, so we were the data crunchers, and then it wasn't cool to be a data cruncher, so we got the storytellers in, right? Unfortunately, they couldn't crunch data. And then we come to the pandemic, and all of a sudden it was like, everybody looked at the revenue guys and was like, okay, you are the guys that have to bring certainty to uncertainty. And a lot of them were used to, to ping-ponging rates up and down, right? All of a sudden that was gone. And they were sitting there and going like, crikey. I have eight hours, what am I going to do, right? Uh, and in Asia, and I think in the US and other parts, we just saw an exit of a lot of revenue managers going out there because there was literally no management of demand mm -hmm. anymore, right? Because there was no demand. Right. All of a sudden, people go like, oh, yeah, crikey. Uh, who's creating the demand, right? And then we are all tech vendors, or three of us, Right? Try and be in hospitality in lockdown when you do revenue optimization. Right? It's like going on a date saying I'm an undertaker. <laughs> right? Pretty much the same thing. But I think we learned that we're not as good as we think we are as an industry and that we have a long way to go. Uh, putting on top, less people have to do more jobs. Even worse, less skilled people have to do a more complex job. And I think you mentioned that in your presentation earlier, right? That's an issue. Because the time of where we can put a UI in front of somebody and say, yo, it's 150, take it, right? Is over because the human itself will sit there and go like, hang on one second, what's in it for me here? Right, because I didn't get the help that I needed throughout the pandemic for whichever reason of data analytics, so on and so forth, right? But I think there is a realization that we still have a long, long way to go. We were put into that leadership position, and I think we were taken down a couple of notches to say, okay, we got to look into the mirror and now restart building that trust going forward. I mean, if you want to come into revenue management, now is the time, the next five years, you're going to smash it. You're going to be the hero. Yeah, because it's growth. <laughs> Unprecedented growth that you do, even if you do stuff wrong, you're still going to make more money. No. That's a very optimistic picture. I want to come back to the role of the revenue manager in a second. But first of all, Alexander, Beyond Price, what did you or what did you perceive that we did different or better or worse than in the past crisis? Well, um, we are experiencing that um, crisis has done a bit of an educational job to the industry. Maybe before the crisis, if you 
did not yet know why you should do revenue management in terms of more than a calculator and a spreadsheet, usually you should have learned by now. Because now's the time demand rises up and we're getting into that um, uh, area after a crisis where we uh, prosper again and we want to grab market share. And so that has a, done an educational job on the industry, on the hoteliers. For us, um, basically all what you guys said, that's where we educated ourselves. Um, what can we do in terms of automation? You told us a lot about automation before, but where is it really, where does it make sense and add value? Because totally eliminating uh, uh, the, the revenue manager away is probably not the solution. Um, so what we learned is automation, where it adds value, get away from these tiny itsy bitsy tasks and your spreadsheets and start thinking about strategy again. Because what you said, I have eight hours to do what I'm going to do with it. Yeah, you shouldn't be thinking about scrubbing manual information from the internet. You should think about strategy, about new concepts and um, new ideas. So that's so, how we look well, at so, it right So now. what did we do better or different? Um, the interest uh, or the, the um, how people perceive modern revenue management mm -hmm. solutions on technology side has improved. Okay, that's an interesting. That's what's better. That's an interesting I, take. I'll, I would like to yeah. comment here because I think that's exactly the, the topic, right? So there's, there's got to happen a, a mind shift, right? So this is why you guys are successful because you're strategists, right? What, what you said, right? If I cannot kind of bump up rates from 190 to 200, like what am I doing? But that shows actually what the the problem is. We have the wrong people in wrong in the wrong position, 100%. right? Because I could tell, I could teach my mother, like, if you have 80% occupants in a hotel, bump up the rate, right? The, the magic thing is if you have 20% occupancy and you understand, you know, that in eight weeks you will be filled to keep the rates where it is or bump it up right now because you understand the market, because you, you understand strategy, right? So I think we have that change. We have all the systems. No matter what you use, you have the systems. We'll make those decisions for you. But then also, you need the people to be able to, to work with the solutions. They, they're not kind of wizards, right? They still need the human input. They still need the strategy. What I said before, like, we're not being made redundant. Just our job will change, and we need a different expertise, and a, probably a different education for it as well, right? So when you see very often where do revenue managers come from, it's, a, it's an evo evolution from, from, from reservation, but we need, we need to give them, and they're great yeah. what they do, but we need to help them and give them a different education, um, studies to, to enhance their knowledge. I, I think we got right. something here exactly. There's like, how do you think this role of the revenue management position or revenue director or however you call the position, how has this role changed? And you said that the interesting thing was, and I, that was something I perceived as well, people were looking at the revenue guys and ladies and say like, okay, give me some kind of orientation as an organization. And uh, some were very good in that. Some were very honest. I said, I have no clue, I have a gin tonic now. And some were like totally overwhelmed because they were not prepared for it. But so how do you see Pontus, how do you see that, that role of the uh, human revenue manager changing? Because I agree with Michael, we, yeah. we got systems left, right and center. The systems are much better than before. They are learning, it's easier to implement them, yeah. but there is still this human element. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, to start answering that question, I just want to say, like, when we talk about revenue management, then it becomes uh, actually a question of what you understand revenue management to be. In, okay, in, what I do you understand? Let, let's quickly get it off the table. What's yeah. the definition for, from, from you guys? From our side, it's the combination of strategy and modern technology and expertise um, and, and uh, experience. And that basically brings that, what Michael said, the, the strategy is so important. And But we're coming from, the historically, uh, where the reservation managers took care of the pricing to uh, needing to have a completely different skill set by a revenue manager that Fabian lifted out um, with basically a, upskilling our people to become more strategists, but analytical, good in communication, um, good in selling uh, your, your points across, etc. But then obviously the future lies in the automation of the price setting part and especially the public price setting part um, and even more to come in the future. But so the future is changing. We need to upskill our revenue managers. I would probably call them like more rightly a commercial director of hotel uh, going forward and that's probably the future 
And, you know, coming from that reservation manager who reported to director of sales, that's a, that's a huge change. Um, and just use the technology as it evolves more and more and keep at the forefront of this. And, I mean, you all guys are doing amazing jobs uh, bringing this industry forward in the whole tech landscape, and it's so important. Um, and we're stupid if we don't uh, go down this path. So, but that's the future as I see it, more automation and more strategic work. If I may add something, sure. I totally agree with you. Um, the revenue management role will be much more holistic. Yeah? It will not about just incrementing a price by occupancy. It will take into consideration much more data, like if it's data from marketing, like quality, like all kinds of things. And I think that is something that probably you would also agree on, Pontus. Yeah. We're looking at uh, the holistic revenue manager of the future. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, the, the, the easy thing is in a panel of revenue managers, since decades, we always agree that it should be more strategic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My question would be: If you have a, let's say, 200-room hotel, four-star, standard city center, or something here in Cologne, and you're looking for the strategic, holistic, director, commercial position, Germany, how much are you going to pay these guys? Because this profile is exactly some person that we are competing with a lot of industries, which are not in the hospitality field and which might be perceived by some young gentlemen and ladies as more competitive in what they offer for the workspace. So how much would you pay such a strategic, super-duper revenue superman in Germany? Everybody, one number, very short. Alexander. I think that's the wrong question, sorry. Because that's not, not a number. Not Fabian. <laughs> I came to Germany a month ago. I have how much idea. would you pay in Singapore? For that one? Yeah. What they're getting paid is too little, about six, seven. Okay, too little, seven. I maybe have to plead the fifth because I have a feeling all my employees are looking <laughs> yeah, at me right now. They're, all, they're on the screen right say. now. <laughs> I, I, build up, I build up pressure for you. I would say eight, 80 plus. 80 yeah. plus per year, yeah. It's, it's an evolving thing, right? Uh, I remember my first job in revenue management, I earned uh, 2,500 brutto a month in Germany. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, I think we, um, we want to pay double than that and uh, even much more coming into the future. So we're going to evolve the salaries uh, with the skill set. I mean, I mean the, the big thing is, and I, I love that we elaborate the role, but we cannot talk about elaborating the role without offering more attractive packages. Same, yeah, yeah huh? but there's, there's another Absolutely. thing, Wilco, right? 80% of the industry do not use revenue-enhancing software, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're a revenue manager and you're not getting in technology, you should be fired. Plain and simple, because how else do you have a background in statistics? No. Right? Do you know how to forecast? No. Right? On Excel, I can. I'm talking forecast well, it, modeling. Well, let's say if you have this right? reservation guy who just gets the title. Yes. But that is, if that we look is, at modern, that is the industry If we at look at modern graduates, I would challenge that for a couple of positions. But I agree with you. It's not yet the minority. It's, it's a minority in the industry. But data science is not part of the curriculum. Yes, of none, course. None of them does statistical modeling come for to, forecast. Come, come to Switzerland. We even, I even had a big fight at EHL Lausanne with Horatio Tudori because he was only teaching statistics and not strategy anymore. Oh, that's uh, good then. And, and we, we, we shifted this, but I agree with you on one thing. We have a lot of people who come from an education where statistics did not play a role, where technology did not play a role, and we're not preparing them well enough at the moment. I totally agree with that one. 100%. But I wouldn't say that there is nobody out there. No, 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 there is. Don't get me wrong. And they will be the superstars going through the ranks. And if you look at the industry, revenue management is the youngest discipline among all of them and the fastest growing, right? So from that perspective, if somebody asks, should I go into hospitality? Should I go into revenue management? Absolutely, you're going to have a job for the next 20 years, right? It will change like any other job, but you are absolutely right. Then somebody comes from banking, pharma, anywhere else, and says, like, I'll double your salary. You want to come to me? And they go, like, yeah, happy days, bye. May I comment? Yeah, you will be super involved with the educational system in Switzerland, uh, especially, I think, within the tourism industry. And, I mean, those universities where I also personally went, there is some focus to the revenue management part, but I think what helped me personally in my career mostly is my nature science background before I came to university with mathematics, statistics, yeah. uh, physics, and so on. And um, I think still there is a huge need to develop the curriculum in the universities of the tourism industry. And um, for the ones that have it, or the fun for the ones that have a slightly different background, but I guess a strategist per se, yeah, that's, that's uh, 
that someone with a different skill set, I think, than what most of the universities now offer. I'm going to take a little bit of a bold approach. Everyone on the stage, Alexander, Fabian, you, Pontos, Michael, we are all kind of a little bit of that role model, to a certain extent. Some of us are more in statistics, some are more in presenting, some are more in leadership, and so on. But we would all fulfill this role. But if we are honest, none of us is working in a hotel, because we yeah. get more money not working at a hotel. True. Would you disagree? Okay, so this is, this is one of the things, and I, didn't, I, I want to make it a little bit provocative because then the rest of the room shuts up finally. Uh, so thank you guys, very nice. But the, the interesting thing is like really, I mean, if we look at ourselves, who of you would be tempted to go back in an on-property role? And the answer would be probably none. Uh, if they would offer us like a super package, we would still not be interested because we love bigger models. Yeah? But we all end up in technology, technology, consulting and services, technology, teaching. Yeah? We do not work in these hotels anymore. So the, so the big trick that we have right here is um, we need this role. I totally agree to it, but we have to drastically change the mindset and the perception and create these roles somehow. And I'm pretty sure, Alexander, if I ask you, do you think that technology can help in this? Absolutely. And I want to ask you a question, Wilhelm. What would be the package that you would say, yes, I want to work at that hotel? Because it's probably, that's why yeah. I said, I think it's the wrong question before, um, probably not only about the, the money side. It's not only about the money, but the interesting thing is, um, if we're talking about like, what is the structure of the package, and I, I agree with you, it was like a little bit an unfair question to ask about money, but it was good, you know, they're all silent now. <laughs> but the, the good thing is, um, I think, a revenue management person or a director commercial is somebody who is, has very tangible goals. And paying them a flat fee is just not getting the right profiles into it. If you have somebody who is so tangible, you should pay them a big bonus if they make you a lot of money. Uh, or you should pay them very little or fire them if they don't reach the goals, uh, unless it's their fault. And, and so I think if we talk about these roles, I don't know the exact number by market. I will not give you a Swiss number because otherwise I get tons of CVs. But the good thing is, the really good thing is like if we start to, to honestly incentivize this person and have them participate on profit, I mean, it's super because what we're doing with technology, we're incentivizing you guys on an increase of profitability. We are incentivizing the distribution systems with the kind of percentage, commission, whatever it is, on Revenue, we're incentivizing everyone. And then we go to our people on site. I say, okay, hey, welcome. You get 5,000 today. And if I want to make you really happy for Christmas, I give you 5,200 and a mobile phone. Yeah? And that's not working anymore. <laughs> but but you, you, no point. I'm going to have a great I, Christmas this time. Are you joining for 5,000? I'm going to hire you right on stage. Per week? Yeah. No I don't problem. know. <laughs> but Virko, Virko, yeah, another, there's another aspect that we need to take into consideration, right? Um, the reason why a lot of people went into consulting is because they realized that A, they're good, right? But B, that they don't need eight hours to manage a property. Can I, can I just right? repeat this one sentence? The reason why many people aren't consultants, the expert Mr. Fabian Bartnick, who traveled the world, said is because they're good. Thank you. Okay, continue. You're very welcome. <laughs> I believe the future of revenue management is outsourcing, right? If you, if I put each of us for eight hours, 40 hours a week into one property or 200 bedroom property, I'll be bored out of my mind, right? Absolutely, because you can do that thing much, much faster because you have learned to take a different approach on how you get to the same end result. Because right? we automation. would automate, right, Michael? Uh, not only automation, but you also know out of your experience, hang on one second, I don't need to do it this part, now I need to focus on that, and not every day do I need to sit eight hours exactly. to then look at it and go like, oh yeah, let's do $2 increase, yep. right? Because the, the time invested versus the return on it is so the, the wrong question about how much do we want to pay them, it's do you actually need to employ somebody full time or can you do a cost-effective approach where you get exactly the same results and the ROI can be lower and you still make more profit because your costs are lower? I hate to jump in like this. Now we got the room silent, we got the conversation going, huh? but now we're running a little bit out of time. If I see the... Do we have an extra two minutes? Daniel? Yes, I think it's a yes. Um, the, the one thing, I would, I would say yes, but it depends, because it depends a lot if I'm running a 200-room hotel, four stars at the airport, I don't need 
a lot of time. If I'm running a 650 key super all-inclusive resort on a tropical island with total revenue management, I probably have enough things to do on my desk. But no, I agree with you, we don't need like one full person in every hotel if we do it smart. And we make, can make it more interesting if we use automation in the right way. Uh, and, and Pontus would definitely not disagree looking at the size of his team that outsourcing is not a good model for it. <laughs> but I've got one question for you that really drives me. It, it, I arrived yesterday at 2 a.m. I was so tired and I thought like, I need to have one really interesting question at the end of the panel. And I wanted to know from you guys, what was the most crazy thing you ever saw in your professional life in revenue management that actually worked? And I'm going to start with Fabian, because I think I know the answer already. Fabian. Uh, yeah, that was in Bangkok uh, for a group. And uh, we had to rent out part of the uh, red light district for them to get entertained. And that turned into a 10-year contract. And that means you rented out by day? Uh, we rented it for the night, and literally the hotel staff went over there, set up buffets, set a room like this, really turned it into a conference <laughs> uh, with the other... So, so the Bangkok answer to the lack of mice demand in Germany is obvious. Thank you very much. Pontus, was, was, was the most crazy thing? And I mean, you're a Swedish guy. You have to see it. You have to have seen cr crazy things happen. Uh... Crazy thing that I saw. I saw uh, in an HOTEL group uh, back in the day, they oversold the hotel so much with overbooking that they had to rent boats uh, at, the, <laughs> at, the, at the river. I think it might actually have been here in Cologne. Uh, and they need to put, uh, put like 100 guests uh, on these boats. But that was quite fun in terms of an overbooking strategy. But I would say, if I can make one quick strategic example um, of where strategic revenue management is important, um, I came to Radisson Blue a couple of years ago, noticed that the big Radisson Blue in Berlin, you know, with the big aquarium, they had great numbers in their group reservation, also in the group rooms, uh, but they lost a lot of money um, in the F&B part or the m and &E part, which was a huge part for this hotel. And that was because they were not tracking uh, group rooms with m and &E and group rooms without m and &E separately. And that's just one example of how a small little strategic change and implementation can open up a window blind and make you do the right strategies going forward. It, it's a very nice example. I love it as a revenue manager, but let's, I mean, let's be honest, the only crazy thing was the aquarium in the lobby. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Michael. Uh, my crazy story was actually in Miami when I was working there uh, at the Zetai, and uh, it showed me the foundations of revenue management. So. There's, the, there's called Russian New Year, right? Um, where a lot of Russian people come to Miami. And then I had a person coming in and say, can you please tell me uh, what um, Mr. Blah 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 Rooms is staying in? I'm like, well, I can't tell you that, obviously. He's like, well, actually, I don't care. I just want to pay more than he paid. So I was like, all right, that's an easy task to do. So uh, we booked him in for a couple of thousand for a suite. So that's also <laughs> revenue management, right? Very good. I, I like this one. Alexander? Well, um, just recently we talked to a, a group of uh, leisure hotels in Europe. And um, when we took the first look into our platform, uh, one of the revenue managers, she got totally crazy and said, oh, my God. Um, and we had to find out what she, she was like nearly breaking down. And we showed her a graphic of how... Uh, um, um, the uh, relation between price and quality is in her comp set. And she said, we did exactly that graphic. It took us five days with two people to do that. And when we, when we saw that, they actually did it manually, really with the like, sketching on a, on a cardboard, all that. And they were pretty close to reality. Of course, the system does that like in real time. But uh, it took them one week, and it worked. It took them one week. It took them one to week to draw handed two a rate shopper. Yeah, no, not rate shopper, but relating uh, putting the comp set on oh. in terms of graphic and quality and sales opportunity and price. They did it handish. They did it handish. They scrubbed all. The, imagine how huge amounts of data there that manually scrubbed. This is the nice thing about crazy. Switzerland. You can't afford it in our country <laughs> to do that manually anymore. They couldn't afford it either, but they did it. <laughs> if if you would look into Let's say demand coming back and so on. Last round, do you see any new distribution channels, any new kind of generators, any new models coming down the street? It's a silence, but I think it's also because I don't think enough is uh, happening in the industry in the distribution side. Booking.com is actually taking too much market share still, and it's becoming almost a sole player for the Central European market. Um, 
what's going to happen with all the travel agents and FITs, we, we will need to see. So I actually hope that uh, more things are going to happen uh, in, that, in that role in the future, in that area. I couldn't think of a, of a new channel, but I think there's a huge opportunity to actually strengthen the own channel, the own brand.com, right? Because that uncertainty what people learned over the past 18 months is actually something we as an industry could take for us because there's still a, a relationship thing going on, right, when you, when you make a reservation. So if I do that directly with somebody, I have a higher confidence, certainty that I can talk with those people if I do it over a third party. So I think there's a huge opportunity for direct. Yeah. And direct we still need to do. Like it's been on the topic for many, many years, but it's still so poorly That's executed. It's interesting, right? It, it's, it's an, I mean, talking in panels about what's next, latest shit and so on, and then looking into what's what's the status of our day-to-day -day jobs and implementation, there's quite a gap still in many, not everywhere, but in many organizations. Absolutely. Fabian. I don't think there's new channels coming out, but I think that, um, and I love blockchain, right? That there is a very good case for single guest profiling across the world, Yeah. right? Because that opens up 100% personalized pricing. Wilco will get a completely different price to Fabian, to Michael, to Alex, to whoever, based on how your profile registers, doesn't matter where in the world. Because if you are called Bill Lee or John Smith, you're kind of screwed globally because you call and there's like 50,000 profiles uh, of you. And unfortunately, in, uh, in operations or in hotels, we don't see the benefit of not ticking that little... A box to say what is the real nationality or something else. So we leave it either for Afghanistan because it's A on the top or we leave it as, uh, as U for unknown. I have to ask you a little follow-up question about this because you mentioned blockchain and the single guest profile. Now in a blockchain architecture I've got a decentralized system. So would that mean that instead of having a central database with all the profiles I have a decentralized guest profile, like a passport ID, which is actually traveling with the guest? Absolutely. Why not? And then you have security measures around it in order to protect the privacy mm -hmm. and open it up not. But it comes down also, how do you see the internet on the next step? Is it going to be a creator internet? So we're seeing it again. NFTs are pushing it forward that the person who actually creates it gets the money. Not Booking.com, not Expedia. They're getting a small little cut for, this, for, the, for the sweat that they put into the reservation, mm -hmm. but it really comes back to yourself. But uh, we're still far away from it. The CRS system, Sabre, Amadeus have tried since years, but I think with blockchain, we actually have a, a use for it that can then elevate revenue management and pricing to, an, a, to a level that we have never seen. Well, well let's agree to one thing. Um, the CRSs and all centralized systems are probably not the best advocates of the decentralization next stage that blockchain is doing. Oh, no, no. They want the single source profile. Yeah, but right? in their central but database. in their central database. Yes. So if we talk about Germany, for instance, um, there is this big project about the, uh, the electronic ID, which goes into this direction. Um, if we talk about these guest profiles, would you rather say it's something like a government ID, or is it more something like a loyalty ID? Or is it something completely different? It's your ID. Why do you want to differentiate between them? Well, the, the question is like, I mean, at the moment, if we talk about a single guest profile, and if we decentralize it, at least I'm still kind of breaking my head a little bit if this profile is then duplicated with Bonvoy, GHA, the German ID, the, ins the health insurance card, and so on, because then the single profile idea gets kind of perverted by having a single profile for every certain supplier again. So if we talk about single profiles... You, you have one, right? You have one. But you have a hash yeah. around it that you can look at it all you want, and, and, and who, but I don't know it's you and, until you open and it up is and who is the provider of that one? Who would you see, Alexander, for instance? That's... I, I have no idea, actually. No. I can't... Uh, by now, my, both my imagination and my technical expertise in this field is too low to really come up with a concept for yeah. that. Well, it, it, to be honest, I think nobody has the perfect idea, but you guys did a lot in casino revenue management. And when I looked in it, and, and I was always jealous about casino and cruise, because you have one thing where you identify the guest, kind of upon check-in, they have to show an ID card. And this is a unique identifier of that person because there are no two Wilhelm Weber ID cards, I hope at least. Yeah? So um, 
Who do you think is, is, is the single guest profile holder? I think we don't have an answer for that, but you know, as much um, the eruption we have right now on, on the hotel market, we will see the same thing in the tech market, right? So I, I expect the next 18, 24 months, some activities in, in terms of M&A, right? Um, we've seen a start with Oracle, um, you know, buying Nor One. So you see kind of first kind of positioning movements where, where kind of the companies position themselves. I think the whole CRSs, when you look at the, the big boys out there, right, the Hiltons, the Arcors, um, they certainly look into getting rid of their old CRS structure, mm -hmm. um, bringing in global players, um, adding a new layer. So probably it is something what we don't know about yet. Same thing where nobody knew in 2007 that the Apple iPhone would come and would kind of you know, take over entirely. So there's got to be something. But as I said earlier, um, I think the opportunity is given now because when you say, when I traveled to London last week, it was insane what data I had to kind of share, which I would have never ever sh shared in the past about myself, but now you have to do it. So pretty much you're forced to it. So therefore you're building the, the foundation to have that unique identifier. But then again, we need to come back to the tech stack, right? If we don't have our tech stack and the, the data doesn't travel, um, it, it will not happen. But um, I don't see anybody there right now, but I'm sure in, in a couple of years we will see some movement there. If we look into this direction, are we actually in Germany or Europe looking at the data privacy protection regulations? Are we actually a competitive prospect market for this, or is China going to run the game because they just don't care about GDPR? Or they care about it in a different way? <laughs> I think it will, it will move away. Um, again, obviously, we are very strict right now, but I have no idea what the governments think on, on that side. But I think in order to, if, in order to be competitive, you've got to open up, right? Because yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a process which will happen. It's just a question, do you want to push it out, or are you going to do it now? Having lived in Asia in the last well, decade, right? Uh, China uses it for a different reason. Uh, that's also happening in Hong Kong right now. Uh, Australia, New Zealand is pretty much comparable to Europe. I mean, Europe mm -hmm. is still the pinnacle, the most anal ones about GDPR out there. Um, you then have states like Singapore, where their standard is, listen, we have a pandemic, right? I hear your concerns about data privacy, but I don't really care right now because we have a pandemic, so just line up or get out. Um, and the other countries, Malaysia, Thailand, it's, it's kind of like a hit and miss, right? Uh, Wilco most probably has 10 different IDs, right, uh, going out there. But the future, the, it, again, it comes down how you see the future. Is it more a government controlled or uh, regulations given as far as data privacy, which I believe we need to a certain extent? But the data itself is answering exactly the same question when you have a management company and an owning company. Who owns the data, right? Mm -hmm. And in your case, you should own the data and you should be able to, to put your profile in as much as you like to your personal gain or to your detriment, right? But there needs to be a safeguard that not anybody and everybody can go until you said it's okay to take it. If you would maybe come up with such a concept today and you would uh, try to establish it in Switzerland, what do you suppose your um, fellow Swiss people would think about that or would maybe do a voting about that? What to, would be the outcome? To be honest, uh, if we take away the blockchain element, we're pretty close because we used what is in Germany kind of the ban card. In Switzerland was the General Abonnement, the GA. And it became the Swiss pass, and it's the one ID that you have to pay for mobility in the entire country. Singapore is Sing Pass. Uh, and, and, and this is, um, so, so if I had, would have to bet on something, I would actually not care about like, who hosts the data. I would try to build an interface to be able to read out the Swiss pass that upon check-in, I mean, it can be a, a plastic card with a chip, but it can also be on a mobile or on any device. People coming in who identified before with that uh, regulation, they can just go and check in and they don't have to fill out the data. They just have to agree and give consent that I can have it. Something like a, something like a social login, but with, let's say, something a little bit different in terms of governance and data protection than a Facebook or Google. 100%. I think when you check in right now, you're breaching any kind of GDPR out there because, so what's your name? Can you write down all the things? Oh, Mr. Bartnick, you're in room 104 today. And thank you for the visa card ending with 3544. And you're living here and there. And if somebody sits next to you and go like, thanks, I copied the identity and I can go out and do fraud with it. 
Uh, Singapore, the same thing. You have one card. If you don't have that card, literally all services are closed to you. Hopefully the future lays more in like face recognition and iris scans and stuff that you don't even have sure. to think about that. And I think from the legal aspect, it's, it's an important thing, but it's a status quo nowadays, right? Like what we have in Europe, what we have now and in 15 years with the new politicians coming, we will have to see. But I think, uh, let's say if the holy grail is um, personalized pricing for people, um, I think there's also a different aspect to that, regardless if we live in a society free of government and, and democratic, I think people will always strive for um, equality as well. And I think if you, people have an individual price for a hotel room, um, I think there's a certain difficulty there in the aspect of equality, where people will be like, okay, I'm, why does that guy pay that and, and uh, I pay this, and we book at the same time for the same date or whatever, right? So that we'll have to see what's there, but I think um, the, hopefully the data is used to increase the guest experience and make them willing to pay even more, let's say. Well, the, coming back to personalized pricing, I mean, I'm taking now a provocative statement and saying like, I don't actually really care about Michael Müller. I just want to get the maximum money out of this person. So um, I don't really care about like putting a name there. I'm actually equally happy just putting them into buckets, managing the buckets well. And um, why do I need the personalized ID? I just, I mean, at the end, if we look into personal price application at the moment, most of the things we're seeing do not end up at single guest profiles, then end up in buckets where you, pro, uh, where you qualify as a, as a guest profile. So I would basically take the thing as like, okay, somebody manage it. Let's hope it's not a hotel company looking at the amount of hacks we have. Yeah? But then I'm just happy if Fabian identifies, and I know Fabian is bucket five, and I've got my pricing ready for bucket five. Last question in this round. Um, the pandemic has changed one thing significantly. And the resort hotels are at the moment a little bit the heroes of the industry because they do it better than we do in the cities. And this is the element of total revenue management. I mean, one of the things that changed significantly is that the spend per guest in a hotel, provided that the offering is there, is much higher than it used to be before. Um, wouldn't it be like the right time to kick off finally total revenue management and just focusing on the room element? Absolutely. Um, it, there are people that are working on that right now as we speak here. But um, I think we all know um, it's not going to be something that we're going to roll out in Q1 next year because, um, again, there are the classic problems that we have um, about interfaces and about integrations. So I take and it we need to integrate a hell of a lot of data to make this um, practically real. Hard to do, but yes, okay. Total revenue management, ready for it? No. No? Why? Because we're not even doing rooms revenue management right. Okay, fair enough. Pontus? Surely this industry has, or this crisis has propelled the evolution for that, but I think um, we're still going to struggle uh, making it a reality. Uh, but it hopefully will come, parts of it at least. This is a super consultant uh, answer, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> Michael? I think we're, posi we're positioning ourselves right now. Um, the, the willingness is there, but the execution is still kind of the challenging piece. Uh, so that will be my answer here, yeah. Brandon, looks like you got a question from the chat. Correct. Actually, it's... It's not a question, it's a, a comment that I wanted to bring up. Um, Niels Makenkamp said we should stop calling this personalized pricing and call it personalized offers. And I think this is a really important point because we have that experience from, let's say, 2000 when Coca-Cola tried to price things personally and it kind of went south because people felt they were getting ripped off. Personalized offers, sounds wonderful. Sounds like they're getting a deal. I think, I think we can buy into that. So we have to do it, but no, good point. Did it come from the chat? Uh, did from you, the I, chat. I, are you logging, is it anonymous or are you logging who did it? No, is we it? know who it is. Oh cool, I wanna know later. Uh, <laughs> cool, first of all, thank you all very much. I wanna say a big, big thank you um, to Anna Hoyer in the back of the room. I thought we had such a smart conversation, so everybody got silent, but actually I found out it was Anna running around like a Fridays for Future with a little, uh, with little uh, 
cartoonage something which says, please stop talking. Thank you very much for that. Thank you all of you guys for being here. And last but least, a big, big thank you to that panel. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks so much, Mirko.